Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Agustino Amos Caguema. He is currently working as an assistant lecturer in linguistics at the Mkwawa University College of Education in Tanzania. He just finished an ELDP funded project titled Kikimbu, Documenting Nomadism in Central Tanzania. Please join me in welcoming Agustino as he gives his talk, Kimbu Country, Language and Culture, an overview. Agustino, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, everybody. I'm very happy. I greet you from Iringa, Tanzania. And uh, as Anna just mentioned, I am a, an assistant lecturer at Mkwa University College of Education, and I have just finished uh, an LEDP to fund the project on Kimbu. And today I'm going to talk about the Kimbu country language and culture as an overview. So as you can see on the screen, uh, that is my photo, my picture. Uh, we are together with Mze Kilunda, who is one of the informants of the Kimbu project, uh, who will, uh, is found in Skonge, where I was working with the Kimbu informants. And uh, the structure of this presentation is going to have introduction. I'm going, I'm going to talk about the Kim country, the Kim language, the Kim culture, and finally, I will uh, just conclude the talk. As I mentioned before, I have just finished an ELDP funded project. So this Kimbu project was funded by ELDP and it was a one year project that uh, aimed at documenting Kimbu language, which is spoken in uh, central South Tanzania by about 60, uh, 62,000 speakers. And the primary focus of the present study was actually initial documentation of the Kim language with a special focus on its unique culture, nomadism. Uh, Kimbu is one of the understudied languages that are spoken here in Tanzania. So uh, I was, uh, I, I mean, I, I was doing an initial documentation of this language, which is understudied. And uh, my focus was on a unique culture known as nomadism. Kimbu is said to be semi-nomadic culture. I mean, they have a semi-nomadic culture. They keep moving from one place to another. And now what was known from the literature? It has been shown that Kim have the semi-nomadic culture, that the Kimbu people tend to move from place to place. Uh, this has been their culture for a long time. So this was known and it has been reported by Shota 1968. And also Kim was spoken in Manyoni, Konge and Chunya, which are actually the, uh, the Kim speaking areas, which are found in uh, Tabora, Mbea and Singida regions of Tanzania. Kim have not only an endangered language, but their culture as a whole, you know. Uh, since Kim is an understudied language, so the language itself is endangered, but also the culture, which is semi-nomadism or nomadism as a whole, is endangered because um, uh, it is the police of the government of Tanzania nowadays not to allow people to move from one place to another in large number as a community. You know, we are talking in terms of the movement of the community from one place to another that has been uh, stopped by uh, the government policies. So, uh, so the movement that is now there is only the movement of the people, one, one person from one place to another, one family from one place to another, not as a community. So the, the, the entire lifestyle of the Kimbu uh, is endangered as a whole, that is uh, known. And it was also reported by Gabriel 2018 that the intergenerational transmission um, of, of the Kim language has virtually ceased and that it is only spoken by adults that uh, um, Children and young people, young generation are not speaking Kimbu today. It's only spoken by the elderly. And the, uh, this also further confirms the, the endangerment of the Kimb language. Um, so that was uh, known. So 
That being known, the plan was made to go to the field, to do the field work, to find out what is there, what is the situation of the Kimbo and to document this language. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Kimbo is spoken in three regions of Tanzania, spoken in Manyoni, in some parts of Manyoni, which is part of the Singida region, also in Skonga district, which is part of Taboro region, and in Chunya, which is part of Mbea region. For this small project uh, was only uh, focused on documenting the Kimbo spoken in Skonge uh, district, which is found in Tabora region. So the field work was conducted in, in, in Tabora region. And uh, I have been in the field for about uh, two months and some, some two weeks, two months and a half. And, uh, but I didn't got the feed and stay for the entire period of two months, no. So I had some, uh, some trips to the feed where I used to go for three weeks or for two weeks, or sometimes I, I used to go for one week and stay there. This documentation actually has been done mainly in two, two wards. Uh, you know, we have administrative areas known as wards. So we have the, the focus was mainly on two wards. One is called uh, Kipili and the one is called uh, Kilumbi. These are two wards which are found in Skonge um, uh, region. So, I mean, Skonge district. So the, the focus was there. So as you can see in, in this picture, this is an, an, an example, I mean, an area of uh, Kilumbi ward where field work was done. And also you can see from here, this is also a uh, Kilumbi ward where uh, uh, recordings of, of videos was and, and, and the audios was done. Uh, this is part of the Kilumbi ward. You can see also, uh, this is also still the part of the Kilumbi ward where we have these two informants, Mr. Abdallah, uh, and, and, and his colleague uh, who actually uh, are doing the, the business of honey collection. So this is, was in the forest where actually uh, we went for recording and they were trying to demonstrate how uh, to make uh, the bee houses, how, how to, to make the bee houses from the bark of the tree. And then so that this is also part of uh, Kilumbi where data was collected. And also, as you can see me on this picture, this is part of the Kipili world, right? So uh, I was just in the uh, area when I was visiting informants coming from one place to another, from one home to another home uh, to do the recording. And then uh, this is also still part of Kipili, but as you can see the lot ways on the left, and on the right. So on the left, you go to one of the villages known as Zogim Lole, which is part of the Kipili ward. And in the right, you go to the village known as uh, Mtakuja, which is also part of the, the, the Kipili ward. So all these areas are areas where I, I went for data collection. Um, worked with 31 language consultants who were engaged in this uh, project and uh, out of them. So the 32nd um, person was actually a local researcher. As you can see him in the picture, uh, his name is Richard John Lupia. Uh, he has been working with me for the entire period of the project. Uh, um, he's actually a Kimbu, but unfortunately he cannot speak Kimbu, but he can understand Kimbu. So as uh, the research, uh, the previous uh, research has just found that uh, in, in, in this area, uh, the Kimbu uh, is spoken by Edda. So Richard being a young people, a young person, it's like many other young person in the area. They do not, they don't, they don't speak actually Kimbu. So, 31 in, uh, language informants where our uh, consultants were uh, consulted and participated in this project with the informed consent and the consent was recorded, uh, I mean, audio recorded, except for few who were, I mean, I mean, most of the consents uh, were recorded, I mean, were video recorded, except for few which were 
audio uh, recording. And also, um, so uh, Richard was there to work with me. He also offered me support for the recording and the transcription and all those. Um, you can still see. So uh, these are some other informants. Uh, sorry. So this is the also the informant, and these are the informants. You can see me there with them. Uh, we are sitting together. Um, we are, it was during the harvest, so uh, while the recording was going on, so we, are, we were also working. I was working with them. Um, they were talking in Kimbu and making stories. They were engaging in, in, in different conversations, and I was there with them. So they are all uh, part of uh, the project because they participated in the project. So we have Mze Hamisi, Mze Abdara, we have Mamatabu, right? So, and we have Mze Bamu. All these are part of uh, the project. And uh, here you can see we have Mze Kilunda and his wife that being here, yeah, they are processing sunflower, uh, which is actually uh, the replacement of groundnuts. Before, uh, I mean, some years back, the Kim community used groundnuts as the source of oil cook for, cook for cooking. But recently, uh, with the coming of sunflower, they are using sunflower as source of oil. So they, are, they were harvesting, uh, they are, uh, sunflower and you can see the ducks this is at home because after they cut those uh, sunflower from the field they bring them uh, at home and they, they started processing them as you can see um, and you can see here also this is Mze Emmanuel he's on in the farm he's uh, digging the farm, he's preparing the farm. Yeah, you can see it is dust because the rain was not yet, but uh, uh, in this Kimbo area, they prepare farms before the rain so that when the rain comes, uh, they can just uh, 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 plant the, the, their crops. Um, so this is Mze Emmanuel. Well, uh, well, in this project, I have, 11 hours of audiovisual materials. That means the videos that were recorded for this project are 11 hours. And I have like nine hours of audio materials. And then I have uh, three hours which are being transcribed. Now, in these 11 hours of uh, audiovisual material, so it's a wide, wide range of uh, audiovisual material, which includes uh, 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 videos at home places in the farm. And so we have a kind of conversations, we have naturalistic occurring data, and then we have uh, elicitation data in the audio visual material. We have a kind of interviews uh, that are there. We have stories, we have songs, right? And we have uh, also narrations about rituals. And um, uh, well, being the you know this all these materials will be archived in the uh, EL archive of the ELDP, uh, but but unfortunately again we have like one hour out of this, which is one hour, uh, uh, which is actually um, restricted. You know, uh, a kind there is a kind of restriction for viewing that, but uh, the remaining materials are open access. So any person can still uh, have access to them through the ELA archive. And then uh, we have these nine hours of uh, audio materials, which include mostly the elicitation data uh, that involve a wide range of word lists and the morphosyntactic elicitation that I have been doing um, with Kim speakers. And we have three hours which are being transcribed and uh, translated, you know, um, out of this, you know, so, uh, these three hours are being transcribed and translated, but some are only translated into Swahili, not yet translated to English, uh, but some of them are transcribed, translated into English and Swahili as well. But uh, I'm still working, I mean, I will continue working with these materials and then 
uh, I will transcribe more hours and uh, hopefully I will also, whenever I get time, I'll be keeping on uh, recording some few uh, materials and then I'll be depositing with the ILA archive of this particular Kimbu community. Well, so we have uh, this Kimbu country, Kimbu country. To Kimbu speakers, to the Kimbu community, they, they have their country and they call their country Nsiya Wukimbu, Nsiya Wukimbu. Nsiya Wukimbu, Nsi means country, yeah, means of, and Wukimbu uh, means, means, means uh, uh, Kimbu. So they have their country. They say that the area where they, the Kimbu community is found is referred to them by, as a country because, you know, they have, uh, the perception that because they had their traditional ruler, uh, as many other communities here in Tanzania, uh, they retained that, that uh, because they had their rulers, they had their army, they had everything. So they retained that they possess a country within Tanzania. So up to date, they still refer to the Kim speaking area as a country. You know? So that is the reason why they call it Nsiya Wukim. So they never refer to it as just a Kimbu area. They refer to it as a Kimbu uh, country because they still believe that the Kimbu country is still um, uh, independent administratively because they still have their local chiefs, despite the fact that the power of the local chiefs here in Tanzania was long ago decentralized. So, the, although the chiefs have no that political power, but still uh, they exist and that makes the Kim community consider their country as, I mean, their area as the Kimbu country. And this country is located uh, somewhere in the areas where Kimbu is spoken. But again, there are two views regarding this country, where exactly the Kimbu country is located. You know, uh, it was already reported in the previous uh, uh, research in the literature uh, that uh, Kimbu countries are uh, located in the today's uh, Manyoni, Kong, and, 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 and Chunya, which are administrative areas of the government of Tanzania. Um, but to Kimbu speakers, they actually these are the views of the uh, Kimbo speakers who are found in this Kong area where the project uh, was taking place. They say that Kimbo country is actually found or located at Kipembawe Ward, which is in Chunya district of Mbea, uh, where Kimbo speakers used to live at first and place, uh, which is now a game reserve. So, but the large part of uh, the Kimbu country, they say is now a game reserve. Uh, of course, Pembawa is still inhabited by some Kimbu speakers, but uh, some areas of the, 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 the world uh, is now a, a reserve. So they say that uh, Kimbu originated from that area. And therefore, that is what they refer to as the Kimbu country because it is a place where the Kim were, uh, I mean, used to stay before they moved to other places. But the second view claims that uh, the whole Kim speaking area in its totality is a Kim country. That means all the way from Kipembawe and Chunya to Ukimbu in, in Manyoni, that area is referred to as um, a Kimbu country. It's not only about Kipembawe where Kim might have originated according to their views, but the entire, the entire area where Kim is spoken uh, is referred to as a Kimbu country because they claim that uh, in those areas, there are actually uh, local chiefs who, who still rule those areas. So they are still referred to as Kimbo areas, not only Kipembawe. So uh, this map was taken from Bala Marcellus, uh, 
2001. Uh, you can see uh, the Kimb uh, area. So the Kimb is somewhere here. Uh, uh, we have Kikimbu North and we have Kikimbu South. So this is the area where Kikimbu is actually spoken. Now, uh, unfortunately, the project was only for Kimbu spoken in Skonge. So it didn't cover the entire Kimbu country, the entire Kimbu speaking area. It only covered the uh, one of the areas somewhere in the central of the Kimbu speaking area, which is Skonge. And uh, Skonge is somewhere between Chunya and Manyon. So it is somewhere between south and north. So uh, if we had to say uh, it is somewhere in the it is central uh, area of the Kimbu country. Today, this country is inhabited by a mix of people from different communities. You know, the, one of the reasons why they refer to this area as a key, I mean, as, as, uh, as a country is that it has been inhabited by only Kim people for a long time. But today, this country is inhabited by a mix of people from different communities. So if you go to, to Kim's Kuma people, you'll find a good number of Nyamwezi speakers, you'll find a good number of Bungu speakers, you'll find a good number of Gogo speakers. So there is a mix of people from different communities who have come to form that part of, uh, of the, 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 the country. So uh, this country, as I said, it, it extends from uh, Kipembao and Chunya. So there are so many villages somewhere in between which speak Kimbu, and some of them uh, include the Kipembao itself, include villages like Irindi, Matuiga, Moyo, Isangawana, Kambikatoto, Ikululilu, Kiombo, Zugimlole, Takuja, Kilumbi, Muwale, Majijoro, Lukula, Kisenyembe, Mugandu, Kimbu, Mitundu, Mwamagembe, Kintanula, and the Ikilili. These are some of the villages where Kimbu uh, is spoken, all the way from Kipembao and Chunya to Ukimbu uh, in Manyoni, Singida. So these are the areas where Kimbu is spoken. Now, so that is what is known as the Kimbu language. Sorry, the Kimbu culture, I mean country. We have this Kimbu language itself. Uh, before I proceed with the language, so I have a short video here I want to play so that you can hear how the Kimbu sounds like. Kimbu Rimbu Dwa Panavakova from Musagula, Omotemi, Omotemi, and Bebam Sagula Tayari. Niki Mukipulile, eh, Homokia Munumba, Homokia Munumba, Penedolo, Sibo, Hadi Limbo, eh, Palipari Limbo, eh, Dimbo, dear Nidi, eh, Haya Panacova Lipakiti, Bahomutu Livanyan Palaman, eh, 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 um, you can hear these two speakers of Kimbu. Uh, they are talking about the local chiefs, that is Temi or Mtemi, uh, who, I mean, singular Mtemi and plural of Atemi, uh, who was the traditional ruler of the Kimbu community. And uh, they are talking about what happened when uh, the king, I mean, the, the, the local chief was appointed into power and all those things. So. As you can see, it is somewhere, uh, uh, it's not in the home, it's somewhere in uh, the areas where other people are not found. So uh, this is one of uh, the piece of Kim uh, clips. And then I have the second one. Uh, a colleague at Jaquanza, no tenor. Quasabu Ipeke Eli, Cocole Pumia, Eve, the Lerecon, the Lerecon, the 
Ogo ndiyo mulinga halisi. Singa mukopeta mumamete gange egona mabe. A a akwanda gya moja uloandi ya geki. Yeah, so this is uh, a video clip of Abdala and his colleague. They are explaining about how to prepare a bee house where you can uh, collect the honey. And Abdallah is talking about preparing that kind of house from the bark of the tree. And, you know, uh, this is a kind of a procedural text which shows uh, how uh this uh how this uh bee house is being prepared so he demonstrates it from the beginning to the end and he takes it up to the tree so this is the kim language and as i mentioned uh kim language has two dialects from uh the literature that is what we know from the literature this is according to Marcele bala 2001 who says we have North and the South Kimbu, you know. Uh, so we have the South Kimbu and we have the North Kimbu. And as, as I said, my I, I went to work with Kimbu, which is spoken somewhere in Skonge. And in my view, it is somewhere in the center of the Kimbu speaking areas. And, you know, the Kimbu speakers have, of course, the same view that we have Kimbu North and we have Kimbu South. But to them, they feel that they, there is a third uh, Kim dialect, they say we might have uh, a central a central uh, dialect of Kimbo, but that needs further research so to confirm uh, what people I mean what speakers really feel about it. And we the question now comes: Are these dialects mutually intelligible? Well, uh, they are mutually intelligible and speakers of these dialects can converse and they can understand each other. But uh, uh, the view of the Kimbo speakers of Skonge is, is like, uh, these dialects are mutually intelligible, but uh, the dialect of, the, I mean, the South dialect to them, sounds more more natural you know i mean more, more, more pure you know this has been a long time uh, uh, feeling you know of, of speakers they they have a feeling of pure and non-pure forms or like those but the thing is uh, the, these dialects are mutually intelligible and speakers from south and those from the north they can understand each other they can converse although, despite the fact that differences in lexical items and other aspects of grammar uh, but that is of course that needs much research to be done on that particular area especially when the uh, the, the the big project bigger than this which uh, when the bigger project is, is done to do a research for the entire uh, kimbu speaking community that means uh, from all the way to know uh, from north to south uh, to come up with evidence whether uh, these different dialects of the same language or otherwise. But what is the perception of Skonga Kim speakers with these dialects? As I, I just said, well, they say that they are mutually intelligible, but they still have those perceptions of the pure and all those. So to them, uh, they have a feeling that uh, they speak Kimbu, but it's not a pure Kim to them. Uh, to them, the pure Kim was spoken in Kipimbao and Chunya, where they claim to be the original place where Kimbu uh, originated. But as I said before, uh, the issue of purity in, in language, uh, it, it has to do with the perception, the attitude of the speakers. Uh, but the thing is, we need more research to be done in the area to see, to find out what are the differences between the Kimbo spoken in the North area and the Kimbo spoken in the Southern area. Um, and if at all, we can establish a third dialect spoken in central central area of the Kimbo, the, the Kimbo area, that's a different story. But as of now, we have Kimbo North and the Kimbo South, but more research needs to be done to come out with evidence for these um, dialects. 
The focus of this project was uh, on Kim, which is spoken in Skonge. Uh, so it hasn't gone that far to, uh, to examine the Kimbu spoken in North Syria and the Kimbu spoken in South Syria, uh, but it's only the Kimbu that is spoken uh, in, in, in uh, Skonge. So uh, as a Nyamwezi speaker, you know, I have a Nyamwezi speaker, uh, I can say that I can argue that there is a recent uh, influence of Nyamwezi to to uh, this uh, Kimb language because I found out many Kimb words, many lexical items uh, which are similar to Nyamwezi. So I have just given some of them here as an example. Uh, exactly in the uh, spoken term in, in Nyamwezi, at least. Uh, uh, the Nyamwez uh, that is spoken in, in Urambo area where I come from. Uh, so we have words like kumwa, which means to drink. We have words like malindo. Uh, this is a traditional food store which are made uh, out of uh, back, back, uh, backs of the trees. And we have ifulila, uh, which stands for pan, which means pan. We have kwimbula, which means to harvest. We have ulinde, which means you wait. We have usole, which means you take. We have hanya hanya, which is actually a duplication uh, from the word in hanya, which means big. So hanya hanya means big, more big. And we have gubula, which means open. And we have kuduhu, which means no. So these are the lexical items which are found in Kimbu. And as a Nyamwezi speaker, I can tell us so they are also found in Nyamwez and they are spoken I mean, they are in the same, same way. But also, I found these words which are closely related, but there is a slight difference in pronunciation. So, uh, for example, uh, we have. Well, but in Yamwez, it is in Huili. Uh, you know, this is uh, ground ground nuts. You know, uh, the product of the ground nuts. So in Yamwez, they call it in Huili, but in Kimbo area, they call it in Twili. Um, I know we have words like in Kalanga in Kimbo, and in Yamwez, they call it in Halanga. So you can see in Kalanga and in Halanga. There is a slight difference of pronunciation. We have makuta in, in, in Kimbu, which is maguta in Nyamwez, the cooking oil. So we have also vantu in, 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 in Kimbu, which is vanhu in Nyamwez, which means people. And then we have injala in Kimbu, but in, in Nyamwez we have nzala, which means hunger. And then we have wutiku in Kimbu, which means I mean, which is pronounced as wuziku in, in, in Nyamwez, and it means night. And finally, we have kinyakale in, in Kimbwe, which uh, is pronounced as kinakale in, in Nyamwez, which means old fashioned. So you can see these uh, lexical items, they have same meaning, uh, but the thing is, they only differ slightly in the way they are pronounced. So um, for phonologists, they can actually establish uh, rules. And of course, for historical linguists, uh, uh, it's a time not know whether Kim has influenced Nyamwezi or Nyamwezi has influenced Kim. But as a, uh, a Nyamwezi speaker, uh, I, I found that uh, there is a kind of recent influence of these two languages, despite the fact that they belong to the same language family. But I think, um, uh, one language might have influenced the other language. Well, let me uh, talk about the Kimbu culture. It was the primary focus of this study to document Kimbu unique culture, that is nomadism. That was the primary goal of this project, to document nomadism as the culture, the unique culture of the Kimbu community. Then what happened? It was very, very unfortunately that nomadism doesn't characterize Kim anymore. As I said, you know, it was clear that uh, Kim nomadism is endangered, but uh, actually it's not only endangered. 
and I dare say it, ha it is extinct. This kind of life is no more in existence in Kimbu community. As I said before, you know, what we were wanting to see is how Kim community, Kim people tend to move from one place to another as a unit, as a group of people. But what is there now is the normal movement of people. Like, you know, I was born in Tabora and I now live in Iringa. That, that's not, not, not nomadism. It's just a movement of one person from one place to another person. So that is what is there like any other community. So the nomadism nature, nomadic nature of Kimbu is not longer part of the Kimbu uh, community. That was very unfortunate. And uh, people seem to have uh, no idea really for uh, what happened in this kind of culture. But what they can really tell is that uh, uh, Kimbu originated from Kipambao and Chunya and then spread to other places. But how this happened, that remains uh, a difficult story for them to tell. And these Kim people used to construct their traditional houses known as Madindiga, uh, which unfortunately again, no more in existence. They are not constructing uh, those houses. The common traditional food for Kimbu is in Sansa, um, Lenda, and Ugali. These are kind of uh, vegetables, and the Ugali is a kind of food that is made from maize. Um, so Ugali actually is common to many other communities in Tanzania, but for Kimbu, it's not made from maize. Uh, they used it Ugali that was made from uh, millet and sorghum, which also as days are going on, they have become acculturated and uh, they have started eating uh, Ugali that is being made from maize. So uh, they are like that. Uh, Kimbu is patriarchal community. Uh, it is uh, the from the male side, from the father's side, who have the power to control the family and to uh, to inherit the property when it happens. The father of the family dies, so it is uh, the male uh, who are going to inherit the, the the family. It's not about. It's not a matriarchal uh, society. So this is a kind of house that has come to replace Madindiga. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the picture, the photo of that house, which is known as Madindiga, but at least I got a story about how this house was constructed. It was actually a, a house that was being made from trees and it was a, a tree house and it, it was, uh, uh, constructed in a, a specific way that they used to do. But this is a kind, kind of house that later on came to replace Madindiga. And uh, again, uh, as you can see at the back of this house, there is a, a more modern house, more advanced house than the, the, the other one you've seen in the front. This means that uh, the Kimbo community also, if you go to that area, many people are now constructing those modern houses. Very few houses are made from uh, matit, they call matit from glasses, right? So it is uh, the the the, uh, the kind of change that you, the Kimbo community have adopted. So uh, in the future, in the near future, I dare say, uh, these uh, houses will also not exist in those communities. And you can see here, uh, they also eat cassava, they grow cassava, as you can see, and they grow potato as well, uh, which is part of uh, the food uh, that they, they eat today in the community. And uh, uh, in most Kimbo speaking communities, again, uh, they don't grow anymore uh, millet and, and sorghum, which was part of uh, their, which was the common food that they, they used to eat. What they grow is actually uh, maize, as you can see in the photo, this is the picture of maize, which are in the farm waiting for harvest, uh, they are dried. And also now, as I said, Kim people eat Ugali. This, this is a picture of Ugali, which is made up from maize flour. So maize is uh, ground and then uh, the flour is stuck and is cooked and this 
product comes as the food, which is known as ugali, uh, which is actually um, a food that is eaten by most communities of Tanzania today. And you can see here also we have these vegetables, are dry vegetables. Uh, the first one in the white bowl is called Nsansa, and the other one in the plastic bowl is called, uh, sorry, the other one in the white bowl is called Nsualu, and the other one in the plastic bowl is called Nsansa. So these are, are, are actually uh, the, the kind of vegetables which are dried, uh, so that they can be eaten when uh, there are no rains. You know, these they only grow during the rainy seasons, and then after that they disappear. So they they are dried for them to be uh, for them to eat as a res food, a reserve food in during the dry seasons. And they say this is the easiest kind of vegetable to cook because after it is dried, then uh, you can. Uh, you can cook it. I have the video for how to, to prepare it and how to cook that uh, thing. So you can see this is an sansa that the one uh, that was this one, which was in white, in, in black, I mean, I mean in, 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 in plastic bowl. So it has been cooked now. It is, it appears in this way. This is called in sansa. And then we have Nsualu, uh, the other one which was in the white bowl. So you can see it in the pot. It is called in Nsualu, uh, so, uh, which is also uh, a vegetable. So uh, you can see here, this woman uh, is prepared, has prepared Ugali and those two vegetables, and Nsualu and Nsansa. And myself, I was there witnessing the preparation of those uh, uh, vegetables and the ugali. And you can see here happily waiting to eat the ugali and the sansa, which was uh, cooked by uh, these people. And then um, these are the firewood, which I used to cook uh, uh, for cooking. This is the, the, the major source of um, uh, energy for them. They use firewood to cook ugali and all other kinds of food. And this is a kind of cupboard they call kichanja, uh, where they, after washing their dishes, they put their uh, on top of it or under that one for them to dry. And sometimes they leave it there for as a, a store actually, as a cupboard to uh, to put those. Uh, 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 dishes, uh, I mean, uh, yes, utensils for cooking and all those. And this is, you know, I showed you a clip of a video uh, of Abdallah who was demonstrating how to make, a, I mean, a, a honeybee, and you can see now it is complete. So that uh, clip uh, shows all the way from the preparation of this one and uh, until this stage, it is put on the tree uh, and the bees will come into that and thereafter they will produce honey and uh, these people will come and harvest honey. So honey now is one of the biggest business uh, uh, that sustains their life. Uh, so they keep, uh, they keep collecting honey for sustaining um, their life. And that is the sunflower, as I mentioned before, it came to replace uh, the groundnuts. Before the groundnuts was the common source for cooking and all those, but now uh, the, uh, the sunflower has come to replace all those uh, groundnuts and it is the oil of this uh, sunflower which is the source of cooking oil. Well, we have, I, I, I cannot name this uh, uh, insect, but uh, this insect is, is one of the, it has an interesting story. Uh, I went to one of the informant's house and there is a hole outside the house where these insects come out of the hole every evening. And my consultant was telling me that, do you see those? They imply that, uh, my ancestors are here with me. They are happy with me. That's why they came here in front of my house and they are staying there 
right? So every evening they come out of the hall and they are very always happy. So this is symbolic to them and they have a kind of belief that uh, they represent the ancestors of those people. And then uh, we have this one, which is called Kimela. Uh, this is one of the raw material which is used to make local beer uh, used in Kimbu uh, community. Uh, and I have a video of how to make a local beer uh, of this Kimbu community. Yeah. What is the future of Kimbu then? The Kimbu country has somehow changed. As I said, uh, Today, the Kimbu country is inhabited by a mix of people from different communities, from different places. So the structure of the Kimbu country has somehow changed. And uh, this study further confirms the endangerment of Kimbu language. Well, after going into the field and seeing the situation, I found out most of young people don't really speak Kimbu, nor do they want to learn it. They say, now, well, why should we learn Kimbu? For what purpose? So they would like to learn Kiswahili, which is the language of wider communication. So to them, uh, Kiswahili, uh, it's better to know Kiswahili, and you are proud. They are proud when they can speak Kiswahili, and they are, uh, they are not happy to learn Kimbu. I mean, they are not interested in learning Kimbu, despite the fact that they, they cannot speak Kimbu, and they are comfortable with that. They cannot, I mean, they don't regret that they cannot speak their, their, their origin language. What they are happy of is that they can speak the language of wider communication. So this is this tells us that uh, Kim was really endangered and it needs uh, 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 immediate attention to rescue uh, this language. So I plan to, as I said, I will be going to the feed and recording more videos and audios and depositing with the ELA. And uh, my plan also uh, is to continue working on this language. So far, I have uh, my MA degree, I haven't gone for my PhD. So I look forward to work on this language in my PhD project. Otherwise, I thank you all. Thank you very much, Agostino, for this really complete uh, and interesting presentation. With that, we can begin the question and answer section, which will be open to voice questions as well as written ones. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand using the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel in Zoom, and I will send the request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that's also still possible, you can do so using the chat uh, module, and as usual, I'll read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. I think I already see a raised hand, of which I think Richard was first. Yes, uh, thank you, Agustino. Uh, first, uh, yes, I just want to thank you for your presentation. Um, it's, uh, you provided us with uh, a lot of the first uh, information about Kimbu um, that that it has been uh, taken directly from uh, interactions with the speakers, involvement of the community um, in, in recent history. So uh, thank you for, for this work. This is uh, really valuable. Um, and I also have a question. So you'd mentioned the uh, existence of speakers of other languages in the area. And I'm curious, um, in addition to those borrowings from uh, Nyamwezi that you mentioned, do you find borrowings from other languages? Do you have any evidence perhaps of recent borrowings versus older borrowings? And then um, finally, um, a related question, uh, have you found any stories of relationships um, in the past between the Kimbu speakers and uh, speakers of other languages. So either positive relationships or, or even uh, negative relationships. And uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Richard, for your two questions. Um, well, as I uh, of course, it's true that uh, there is interaction of Kim with many other languages. And uh, as I mentioned, the last Sukuma, Nyamwez, and all others. And, uh, you know, the borrowings that I have exemplified from Yamwez is just because I 
um, a native, I mean, I, I speak Nyamwez, I understand Nyamwez. So when I heard these key words as a researcher and as a speaker of Nyamwez, I was able to tell that these are the uh, words which I also found in Nyamwez or even uh, they are just, if they are not found in Nyamwez exactly, but they are closely related in the pronunciation and the meaning. But I, I haven't uh, tried to find uh, the borrowings from other languages. So uh, I will work actually on that and to see if these are the languages which are in contact with Kimbo today have influenced Kimbo as well. Two, the stories about Kimbo and the relationship with other communities, whether they were positive or negative. Um, well, I, I, I try to, to ask these elders about this uh, Kimbu community and the war that they used to fight and the relationship with other communities. They that uh, the Kimbu community had hostile relationship with the Nyamwezi people, but with time they came closer. And uh, in one of the areas. Uh, the local chief of the Kimbu today is actually a Nyamwezi person, a person from Nyamwezi community. Although his mother was from the Kimbu community, but he's a father from a Nyamwezi community. So today their relationship is uh, good. But in the past, they said that it was somewhat, not, not much hostile, but it was not uh, good. Great, yeah. nice. thank you. Yeah. And the next hand that went up was from Bonnie Sands. Thanks. Thanks for this important work. Uh, it's very exciting to see. And my question was, was it difficult to convince people that the language was endangered? Was it known that it was endangered before you started your field work? And, and did that make it difficult to, to get the funding? And I certainly hope you get more and can keep working on the dialect situation. Yes, please. Could you hear me? My question was, was it known how endangered the language was before you started doing your field work? What did ethnologues say about the language? Because to take a language with 60,000 speakers, I imagine it would be hard to convince people, no, this language is endangered. Okay, thank you. Well, this language actually, uh, even ethnology itself, um, claims that this language is endangered, the status of this language is endangered. And um, um, so it was, there was a support from ethnology and there was a support actually from the work by Shota and there was a support from the work by Gabriel. All these researches uh, showed that this language is endangered from different perspective. Uh, for example, uh, the number of speakers, uh, of course, is relatively high, but it is sparsely uh, distributed into three regions of Tanzania. And then also, uh, the, the less, I mean, the intergenerational transmission of the Kimbu language has virtually ceased as uh, it's observed that uh, young people don't really uh, speak Kimbu. So the, the language itself is uh, endangered. And if at all, uh, because the, the, the figure that the number of speakers is actually from 2008 by the Lotte project even decreased further. Thank you. Thank you, that's so, uh, Martin Mouse. Um, yes, uh, uh, extremely interesting, uh, Augustino. Well, every, everybody has said that already. So uh, let me ask you about, well, um, confront you with how I, I have read uh, Shorter. Uh, when he did his uh, research, I think that was in the 60s. Uh, yes. he, what he described for nomadism was a situation in which uh, people are part of the year farmers and part yes. of the year hunters. Yes. And when they are farmers, they do stay in the same area for a number of years and then until the soil is exhausted and then they go to another place, not 
to a yeah. random other place, but also that was organized. So that yeah. is a, um, that's I find a very interesting uh, system, which is maybe not rightly characterized simply with, with nomadism. So um, the question is, uh, did you find any any relics or memory of, of, of that kind of system? And uh, second question, uh, which I will also pose right now, because I have to leave in a minute, is that uh, when you read in, about the oral histories of the of the Gogo, yes, far from the area where you are, they mention that that they met Kimbu people there. So I, I again, I'm really uh, I'm really fascinated by these people. I want to watch in enormous uh, area they, were they not. Um, uh, dispersed. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, thank you, Martin. And uh, um, you have uh, asked about if I had uh, I had found any memories about the stories of uh, the kind of nomadism that you have just mentioned. Um, I actually I didn't find the memories of that kind of. Uh, uh, the pattern of uh, movement from one place to another after the land had exhausted. And uh, the Gogo, as you mentioned, is not far from the Kimbu. Okay. And yeah, yeah, the Kimbu and the Gogo are actually, because Kimbu extends all the way to Manyoni and the Gogo also extends all the way to Manyoni. So they might have come into contact uh, in that area. Oh. Uh, in Maria, where Gogo is spoken and Kim is spoken. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And I see that there is a question in the chat as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was from <laughs> Andre Swap. Uh, what were your experiences with swearing in the community? Did it ever come up in the documentation process? Yes. Oh, no, it didn't come up in the documentation process. Okay. That's Bonnie. And then Richard raised his hand uh, for a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I've got a second question. So you'd mentioned uh, that there were two dialects previously uh, re reported, and then now there might even be a third dialect. I'm curious, in conversations with Kimbu speakers, did they mention any specific characteristics or features of the different dialects, or was there perhaps a way that they described the way that speakers of a certain dialect talk. So oftentimes you'll hear um, a sort of non-specific characterizations of dialects uh, by native speakers. They might say, well, they draw out their words or they talk quickly or something like that. So did you encounter any, um, any descriptions like that of the different dialects? Yeah, uh, thank you, Richard, again. You know, I, I, I encountered a kind of actually lexical descriptions or characteristics of the two dialects. Uh, then I don't know now, the, the, the Kimbu spoken in Skonge, whether it's north or south, actually from my perspective, it belongs to the uh, dialect because it's Uh, this, uh, I mean, in, in their dialect, in their uh, Skong dialect, they call, for example, maize, they say mdeg, but they, they say, so for us, maize is mdeg, but if you go to Kipembawe, they don't say mdeg, they say magagwe, right? So that was a common, a common I mean, example uh, most of the consultants gave. So it was actually from lexical evidence. They kept on giving examples of lexical evidence. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I, that would be a, a great starting point, I think, for a description of the, uh, the different dialects, uh, those lexical differences. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, thank you. Bonnie, is there mm -hmm. or not? See if she wants to unmute. Thanks. <laughs> it wasn't letting me. I'm interested in how the ancestors communicate 
through nonverbal means when people have stopped speaking the language of the ancestors. So I wonder which comes first. Do you ancestors communicate through insects? Did they, have they always done this? Or, you know, is communication with the ancestors a way that uh, encourages people to preserve their language at all? Um, I'm just, I don't expect you to have answers to this, but it's an interesting question to me. So if you ever think of asking people about this, I'd be, I'd be curious. <laughs> Maybe you can hear from others as well. That's interesting. Um, have people thought about that as a reason to maintain their language? It sounds like it, the young people you've talked to don't really mind that they're losing the language, but yeah. have they thought about these implications? Um, I, 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 mean, I really don't think if they have thought about that because they are comfortable uh, that they don't speak their language and they're happy with that. What? Richard notes in the chat that for the Shona, you communicate with the ancestors through playing music. I heard about another group in, uh, I think it was Zimbabwe, where you're speaking in spirit language anyway, when you speak with the ancestors. So it's just a question of why maybe in Africa, language shift happens. It's perhaps uh, not more easily, but with less pain, maybe, than in other parts of the world. Right. Then I, I think we basically reached the end of the question uh, and comment section for today. I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentation in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the um, Rift Valley YouTube page. Uh, and entries for each presentation are also added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 30th of June, for which details will be announced later. I would like to thank Augustino again for his presentation and of course everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.